The U.S. Navy SEALs, according to some, make up the most elite, fiercest fighting unit in all of the U.S. military, and maybe, maybe even in all of the world. Of course, it always depends on who you ask. But those who are members of that unit don't get to be so just because they decide to sign up. They don't become members of the most elite fighting force in all of the world just because they put their names on a list. There's training involved and a lot of it. In the training course no, known as BUDS, B-U-D slash S, Basic Underwater Demolition slash SEALS Training, it lasts for 24 weeks. There's a three-week indoctrination period and then three seven-week phases, each one focusing on a different aspect of special operations warfare. And phase one, which focuses on physical fitness and teamwork, is maybe the hardest phase. Or at the very least, that's where most of the attrition happens. That's where most of the dropouts drop out. Phase one is designed to test the limits of what the human body can do, to be physically demanding, to see who can make it. And if 100 sailors go into SEALs training, go into phase one together, about 25 of them will come out together. 75% attrition. And those who do drop out, usually drop out, most of them drop out during the fourth week of phase one, which is known as Hell Week. Hell Week starts on Monday at midnight, and it goes until noon on Friday, and it goes nonstop. During those five and a half days, those recruits might get three to four hours of sleep total, not per night. And so every other hour of that time period is filled with push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups, log carries, small boat navigation across the water and across rocks, obstacle course. It's filled with constant physical activity, running and swimming for miles. And if you think about that, think about what it would be like to be sleep-deprived like that, to have no rest whatsoever, to constantly be on the move, to constantly tax your muscles and your heart and lungs. Imagine how much pain you would be in during that time. Imagine how difficult that would be. I could bore you with some of those details, but, but you could probably figure it out for yourself. The toll it would take on the human body. How hard and difficult and painful that would be. And it would make you wonder, why, why would anybody want to do that? Why would anybody put themselves through that? It's, it's totally voluntary. Well, that's what it takes to be a Navy SEAL. And those who understand that, those who know that, those who really get it, those are the ones who succeed. They are among the 25% that get all the way through. Because they know that that's what has to happen. That's the training that takes place. And they know that if they get through all of that, if they get through phase one and hell week and BUDS training, if they get through the, the next 26 weeks of specialized training, if they make it through all of that, they will be Navy SEALs and it will be worth it. They'll be able to put that trident pin on their uniform that identifies them as a member of the most elite special forces unit in the whole world. That's what they're looking forward to. The pain, the hardship, that's what it takes to get there. And in the end, it will be worth it. And there's something to that, isn't there? Something that we might take from that, to know that the hardship, the difficulty, and the pain, that in the end, it's worth it. And we can get through those things. We can endure that difficulty and that pain if we know that, that what's waiting for us will be worth it. If there's something that we get to have at the end of it all, a reward, an accomplishment. Imagine how difficult life would be if there were no rewards, if it wasn't going to be worth it. Imagine a marathoner running his race, but not really knowing if the finish line would actually be at the end of 26.2 miles. Maybe not knowing where the finish line would be. Maybe not knowing that it even exists. Would he keep on running? Or to borrow an illustration from our Savior himself, as he speaks about in our text, imagine a woman in labor giving birth to a child, but not knowing if the pain would ever end. Not knowing if she would hold that child in her arms soon. 
How could she stand it? How could she take that, that kind of pain? And let's look at our, our Savior's disciples today. Imagine what it would have been like for them to do. Imagine not knowing. Imagine the uncertainty. When Jesus is speaking to them, he is there with them in that upper room on Monday, Thursday, the night before Jesus was put to death. And so there they were, hours from his death, weeks from his ascension, and months away from being sent out into the world on their own, sort of, to proclaim the good news and to suffer abuse and persecution at the hands of unbelievers. Imagine what they would go through, the floggings, the beatings, the imprisonment, the torture, the ridicule, being driven away from one city after another. Imagine all of those things that they're going through. Only one of them would actually die a death of natural causes. The rest would die in shameful and shocking ways. They would need some kind of encouragement to know that it's all worth it. Something to look forward to. Imagine how difficult if they had no knowledge of what would happen at the end, or if there even would be an end. So Jesus encourages them. And in doing this, he encourages us too. So before all of this takes place, there is Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, and he says, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. There's a lot there. There's a, a lot of words that Jesus speaks, a lot of things that he tells his disciples. And it's good news. It's comforting. Even if it doesn't look like it at first. Again, hours before his death, weeks before his ascension, months before the disciples went out into the world to suffer persecution. Jesus is not here telling them that it's going to be a joyride. He doesn't sit them down and say, take it easy, guys. It's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. He doesn't say any of that to them. He tells them that their time on earth is going to be filled with grief and mourning and weeping. He tells them that it's going to be hard. In the Navy SEALs, they have a saying, the only easy day was yesterday. In other words, it only gets harder and harder. Training only gets more and more difficult. The missions they go on only become more difficult. The only easy days that they have are the ones that are over and done with. It's not all that different from the Christian life. The only easy day was yesterday. We have many difficult things ahead of us. So no, Jesus does not fill their heads with delusions of grandeur. He doesn't tell them about all the success and the wealth that they're going to achieve for themselves when they go out into the world and when they tell people about Jesus. But he does say that in the end, their grief will all be worth it. Because one day they will get to exchange that grief for a joy that cannot be taken away from them. The joy of heaven. Wouldn't that be the thing that would sustain them while they struggled with the inherent, inherent difficulties of being a disciple of Christ? To know that one day, one day it would all be over. But that begs the question, when is that going to be? What day will that happen? And this was the question, and this was the, the confusion that prompted this whole discussion, the, the thing that the disciples didn't quite understand. Jesus talked about that day, and he said it would happen in a little while. And that's what they didn't get. The disciples were wondering. Jesus was evidently saying some pretty cryptic, cryptic things to them. They didn't, they didn't get where he was going with this message he was giving to them. And so Jesus, because he knows all things and because he knows what his disciples need, he explains it to them. He lets them in on what he's saying. We read, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? 
It's probably not difficult for us to figure out what Jesus was saying because we have the Gospels, we have the book of Acts, we have the book of Revelation, we have all of the events of history laid out for us, so we see everything that happened after Jesus was there in the upper room with his disciples. We know about the crucifixion, and we know about the resurrection, and we know about the ascension. But the disciples didn't understand that. We get that that after a little while, just a few weeks after this, Jesus would ascend. The disciples wouldn't see him anymore. But for them, that was difficult to wrap their heads around because they couldn't imagine life without their Savior. They couldn't imagine what it would be like when Jesus would go away or that he even would go away. This is what they didn't get. This is what Jesus needs to explain. And then this whole business about them seeing him again after a little while, what what is that about? Where's he going? What's he going to do? It was all pretty confusing. But if you hear those words, if you listen to them, if you listen to the things that Jesus is saying, it's actually very comforting. Especially because of that phrase, in a little while. Jesus told his disciples, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. After a little while, not long. And in the grand scheme of things, that weeping, the mourning, a life filled with grief, that life that would be the disciples while they worked on earth, It would only be a little while compared to the joys of eternal life in heaven. Like that. A woman giving birth to a child only has that pain for a little while. Somebody training to become a Navy SEAL trains for 50 weeks. But in comparison to the years of deployments, the years of service that are ahead of him, it's it's just a little while. But that might be hard for, something, hard for us to really understand. Maybe hard for us to adopt that perspective, especially when the grief that we have in this world seems like it just goes on forever. And for some of us, it doesn't ever stop. To experience one heartbreak after another can just wear a person down. Life is hard, even in the best of circumstances. Even when everything is going well, it's, it's hard. Hard to, to be a spouse, to put somebody else's needs above our own. Hard to raise a family, to bring up children in the ways that we want them to go, and to keep out the influences of the sinful world. It's hard to be a faithful, dedicated employee while at the same time being a faithful, dedicated spouse, trying to balance those two, it just never seems to work. It's hard. Even in the best of circumstances. It's rare that we ever have the best of circumstances. How difficult it becomes when relationships become strained, when couples part ways, How difficult when when we stay up at night worrying about the child who was on a a wayward path and and not knowing what to do about it. How difficult when jobs just aren't found. When good work is, is difficult to come by and we lay awake at night wondering how we're going to pay for all the things that we need in life. How are we going to keep a roof over our heads? How are we going to keep the lights turned on? It's difficult. It's hard. It seems like it it never goes away. How easy it would be to just throw in the towel. The disciples didn't get what Jesus was saying, and sometimes it feels like we don't get it either. What do you mean by a little while? What are you talking about, a little while? This has been going on for as long as I can remember. Jesus, I'm living in this world and nothing has ever been easy for me. Nothing has ever gone the way that I want it to. And it seems like the more I dedicate myself to you, the harder it gets. Not only do I have to struggle with the things in this life, but I have to do it alone. 
Because the people who would support me, they don't want to have anything to do with you or your word. Friends and family have abandoned me because I proclaim your name. And to them, that's foolishness. This hasn't been going on for a little while. It's been going on since the beginning. What do you mean by a little while? And how easy it would be to turn against God, to turn him into the enemy, to see him as the enemy. You aren't doing anything to help me, Lord. How easy it would be to to go along with the ways of the world because Jesus said, right now the world rejoices while we weep and mourn. We don't want to weep and mourn. Let's rejoice. Let's do what the world does. Let's go with them. We don't want grief and pain. Going through that, who would ever want to do that? Who would ever want that kind of life? We need some help with this, don't we? Those questions ever popped into your mind? They they sure have popped into my mind time and again. You ever thought about those things? Wondering what Jesus meant when he said, after a little while. Well, what do we know? After a little while, we will see him. And Jesus explains that to us. He explained it to his disciples. Not not in the words that he spoke to them at that moment, but, but later on. A few days later, he explained it to them when they came to his tomb and they found it empty. He wasn't there. Completely empty except for the burial clothes that were lying there and nobody was wearing them. Jesus explained what he meant when he rose victorious over death. Power over the grave. That victory is ours, and that victory is coming to us. And that is the good news and the comfort of these words. He is alive, which means one day we will be too. We have heaven to look forward to. It will all be worth it. And on that day, we get to see our Savior with our eyes. We get to see him face to face, because the sin that would separate us from him is no more. The sin and the sinful flesh that we have in this world is done away with and instead we are transformed and renewed to be like his glorious body so that we get to be with him. Glorious as he is. Victorious as he is. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what's going to be there at the end after a little while. And yes, even the sin... Even the sin of wanting to dismiss Christ in favor of the comforts and ease of this world. Even that sin is taken away. Even that sin, Jesus does not hold against us. But instead, Jesus has come into this life. Come into this eternal life. And take your joy that can never be taken away from you. That's the good news. But still, it's, it's it's hard to grab onto that. It's hard to hold on to that. After a little while. It doesn't seem like it. Well, we remember, this is God's definition of a little while. And when we think about the life that we live in this world, 70 or 80 or maybe more years than that, it is a blip compared to the eternal life that we have in heaven, the one that just keeps on going, that can never be taken away from us. It'll be ours after a little while. Somebody training to be a SEAL knows that training eventually comes to an end. Somebody running a marathon knows that the finish line is there, somewhere. Somebody giving birth knows that that she will hold that baby in her arms. The Christian living in this world knows that after a little while, we will have joy that can never be taken away. As hard as it is, as unpleasant as it might be, We know that we have heaven after a little while and we'll all be worth it. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.